Welcome back to Inside Marketing Design. This is the show where we go behind the scenes with tech companies and learn about their brand and marketing design processes from the people who are doing that work. I am your host, Charlie Marie. I'm the creative director at ConvertKit and I'm very excited about today's guests. Yes, plural, there are two of them, cause they work on the marketing design for a tool that I use every day in my work at ConvertKit. In this episode, I'm speaking with Noga Grinberg and Danielle Hassan from Monday.com. Monday offers workflow management tools that help teams to collaborate on projects and stay productive. They are a global team with offices in the US, in London, in Sydney, in Poland, as well as Tel Aviv, where Danielle and Noga are based. They've both been at the company for about two years and they each cover different sides of brand and marketing design at monday.com, working on different channels, which is why it was great to have both of them come on the show to be interviewed. I know you're going to get a lot of value from hearing about their approach to data and ownership, as well as hearing about the process behind creating a Super Bowl ad, which I definitely love learning about. First though, a huge thanks to Webflow for sponsoring the season of Inside Marketing Design. If you find that you're not able to like iterate and make changes to your marketing site without it requiring a lot of dev time, then perhaps you should consider switching to Webflow. Not only does it have a visual canvas that you can build the site in, but it also has a really powerful CMS that lets you create collections of content and easily work with that content and the data stored in it in your designs. If you've been stuck using something like WordPress in the past for a while, then I know you're gonna be mind blown at the possibilities that come from having total control over CMS fields and how they appear in your design. I know that was something that really stood out for me when I first switched my sites to Webflow. You can learn more about it at insidemarketingdesign.com slash Webflow. But now let's take a look inside marketing design at monday.com. Welcome to Inside Marketing Design, Danielle and Noga. Let's start by you telling us a little bit about each of your roles at monday.com. So I am a creative designer in the web presence team, which is basically in charge of the homepage of Monday and the website and the mm-hmm. entire experience of the users until signups. Nice. And what about you, Noga? I am also a creative marketing designer. I am part of the app marketplace channel, user marketing, which is a new channel, which we'll probably elaborate more about it and the brand awareness channel. Nice. And where do your roles fit into the team at Monday? So we are part of the marketing department, our channel, Mm -hmm. which is another name for teams. This is how we call it with Monday, are a part of the marketing department. And we are also a part of the design guild, uh, which contain all other uh, designers, product, uh, internal brand, user research, video and uh, motion, and it's around 90 designers. Whoa. So, yeah, we are 16 creative marketing designers within the guild, and we're also in the marketing department. So within that, do you report up like in the org structure to marketing, but then you're part of the design guild you meet as a like cross-functional team? Exactly. Nice. So you mentioned channels is like your way of having teams. How many different channels are there? And do you work on like more than one channel as designers? We have about 15 channels. It's uh, social acquisition, organic social, YouTube, SEO, partners, user marketing, app marketplace. Like there's a lot and we keep adding more. I think since I started Monday, I always have two channels, even three, like right now. But it really depends on how, like, how wide. I mean, you could be like 70% in brand awareness and another 30% of your work week would be like another channel. And what is it like for you, that split? So it changes, but right now I'm like 70% on the app marketplace because it's really like Mm -hmm. the focus of the company right now. Yeah. And it's an area that didn't really have any marketing till now, and it really grew organically. So now in this point of time, my focus, but before that I was like 50, 50 brand awareness and like the other channels. Yeah. And what about you, Danielle? I'm hundred percent in web presence, but when I started, (laughs) I was in Google AdWords and web presence was smaller, but over time we saw, okay, we have tons of work here. Let's do Mm. it time so it's very dynamic yeah and you mentioned that there's about what did you say 16 of the creative marketing designers yes so how many designers per channel 
Usually it's one per okay. channel. And that is that how it is for you? Is that are you the only one on web presence? I'm gonna guess that there's uh, more, more on that side. Yeah, good guess. <laughs> so for a while I've been the only one, but I think three or four months ago we recruited another amazing designer. So nice. now we are two, but I think it's the only channel that have two. Uh, wow, also That's brand really awareness. Interesting. Ah, also there brand awareness. Okay, so brand awareness has more than one as well, especially at the moment, given that your focus is more on that marketplace. That makes sense. Right. Yeah. It's really interesting to me to hear that a company the size of Monday.com had just you, Danielle, on web presence for a while. Because, I mean, it's I at ConvertKit, it was just me on our marketing site, but we were only a team of 60 at that point. So it made more sense. I think it's a matter of growing. Like over time, mm-hmm. the planning to recruit more and more designers, it's a matter of time. I know that at Monday.com, there's a real sense of like ownership of the channels that you work on as well. Tell me more about what owning a channel really means at at Monday.com. So each channel is a team. Some are bigger, some are smaller, as we said. And a team can consist of a marketing manager, a content writer, a product marketing manager, and of course, a designer. And basically it means owning the professional aspect of design in the channel. We're not service providers. We work as a team. The design guild at Monday is an integral part of the decision-making process, like setting the KPIs and the priority of project in the channel. And I really think that what's unique about Monday is that every stakeholder is viewed as a thought partner. All of our voices are really relevant to the strategy and sometimes even lead the decisions we take as a team. I can and actually am expected to challenge the content writer, for example, so I can see something and say, hey, it doesn't make sense to say it this way. And they listen and change accordingly and vice versa. Or sometimes we think of the copy when we mock something up and it just we go with it because everyone on a team like it. And also if I have an idea for a new creative, there's no reason I won't start kicking it off the next day and promoting it. And this is what I'm expected to do too. Raise the ideas, I go, I check it, I user test it, I share it with the team. And it also puts me in the position of leading the team and the team's decisions. I love what you said about how you're integral partners and not service providers. Because I think that is... In my opinion, that's the key to succeeding in the roles that we work in is thinking in that mindset and not just churning out the work, doing exactly what someone like spells out in a brief, but like bringing your own thoughts and opinions to it as well. It's not the top down approach. We're part of the strategy completely. Yeah, that's fantastic. And does that mean that every designer at Monday or at least on the creative marketing roles, is everyone quite at a senior level to be making those types of decisions? Titles change, but the designers at Monday, and I think all the people that work here have critical thinking and a broad view of things and have a senior state of mind. So whatever a channel or a project will be is what we make of it. Yeah, I think it's kind of like the culture and the people that work here. Yeah, that everyone has that like critical thinking Uh, aspect to them. Right. We're like a little bit of entrepreneurs each in our own channel. Yeah. I've heard that be described before as intrapreneurs, where you're like being entrepreneurial, but inside a company. Yeah, I like it. Tell me more about the culture of feedback then that comes from this idea of everyone owning decisions and like you can decide what is the best design for the projects that you own. But what does that mean for feedback and how do you share feedback on each other's work? So in general, as we say, we have a very pro-feedback culture in Monday and we really encourage to hear everyone's voices and to hear the inputs from everyone because we work with experts, each one in its own field, and it's really valuable for us to learn from everyone. But if we like drill down to the channel level, we actually kick off every project with a team brainstorm and we set the quarter KPIs and goals together. In general, we are part of every aspect aspect, sorry, uh, of the team. And we also have the design guild that we're doing a peer-to-peer review inside of it, design reviews, and we also meet on a weekly and monthly basis. And even though we work on different teams in the day-to-day, we all share the same design values and way of work. So the guild is really built to give us the support and 
each one has its own like unique skill set and we complete each other. And also like despite all of the feedbacks, I would definitely say that no one is a bottleneck. Like at the end of the day, I have the full ownership and autonomy to decide on the project I'm in charge of. I can take all the feedbacks, decide what is like good for it or not, and continue with this for the good and for the bad. So the ownership aspect is really present in everything we do. Yeah. And you're using feedback like as information, but you're not beholden to addressing exactly. every single thing. Yeah. Exactly. So you said that you meet as a design guild weekly or monthly. Is that all like 90 or so designers are together in a room giving feedback? Uh, not exactly. So all right. that's a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of people. We meet one-on-one -on -one for design reviews. So okay. usually I will meet with someone who's kind of related to the project or I know mm. like that can bring me added value for this. We meet on a weekly basis, just the creative marketing designers. And then we like 16 people. So we can still do brainstorm sessions and share stuff and get some feedbacks. And like once a month, we meet the entire design guild, but we have a kind of long meeting, but it's more of like high level stuff that we mm. share and stuff like this. So it's, it's escalated. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So with this, with every designer responsible for making decisions and 90 people contributing to what good design means at monday.com, mm -hmm. how do you ensure consistency in your brand? What do you have in place to make sure that every designer has like the right guardrails on the decisions that they're making? In general, it's important to understand that Monday as a company and as a product is constantly evolving. And as a result, also the brand is keep changing, is growing and growing all the time. And for designers, it's create like a space for experimenting and iterating on, on everything we do. And it also brings a lot of challenges. So we can definitely say Monday is a breathing brand and it's very dynamic. But at the end of the day, we all commit to the same brand book. We share the same like design assets and the same rules. We all commit to it. And this is exactly why we're doing design reviews for answering those questions or to brainstorm all the stuff. Like sometimes you don't know the answer and you like need to figure it out together with other designers. And also like Danielle mentioned before, the peer review is done in context. The brand has like slightly different rules on each channel. Internal brand is different from the blog or the partners or social organic. So the review is done with a designer who has experience in that area. And we're part of the business flow. The review is not only at the level of the colors or the brands or the shapes or the layout. It's more like holistic. We go over the flow that the end user will experience. How do they get to this banner? Does the CTA make sense? What page will they land on? Is there a visual connection between all of these steps? Is there a messaging connection? Uh, so we make sure that the flow makes sense. On a more technical level, we work with a design system on Figma. So we have a lot of the marketing assets already in there, different types of boards, our brand colors, shadows. If we change anything, we change it in a design system and it updates cross scale. Nice. And yeah. so that way that you're not really having to give feedback and check at that granular level because everyone's using the system and so you can focus the conversations more on right. the, like strategic things that you were mentioning so that's i like that it's like the brand is self-governing in a way in that everyone is responsible for it and everyone is responsible for calling each other out if you see things happening that you know are not on brand that becomes a discussion i really like that approach to it ultimately because you mentioned that you all work from the same brand book so what happens when you decide I don't know that like we need a different style shadow or a different style color who decides that and like gets that implemented is that a group effort as well if we want to change anything on the brand we will probably assemble some kind of task force for that and we'll probably start with some kind of hackathon with the whole team and then that task force will continue working on that and we come back to the team share it with the team and sometimes we even let the team play with it for a week or two and see like 
Does it work? Does it work in acquisition? Does it really work in, on social? So I can't say that it happens every day. So it did happen. Yes, it's rare now. to add different colors and things like that. We don't do that every week. <laughs> right. It did happen now with the re rebranding. And that's sort of like what this process looked like. Cool. So again, it sounds very similar in that it's like a self-governing group effort. There's not one person in charge, but you're deciding as a group. So let's talk then about measuring success of the work that you do, because I am definitely getting the sense that there are like a lot of things in place for this. It seems like you've got a lot of really good structures in place at monday.com. Yeah. Are you each responsible for certain KPIs for the channels that you own? So first I'll say that at Monday, if we can't measure it, we won't do it. Um, yeah, it's really like that. The KPIs, of course, are set per project and each project's KPIs are set according to past results in similar campaigns, or if it's something completely new, we will sit down and understand what's the right KPI. And each project in each channel is measured differently. But yeah, of course we have it. Yeah. And for example, like if I can just give some example from different Please. KPIs, like on my team, on web presence, we measure soft, hard, and qualified signups. And on the brand awareness team, they can measure a cost per new visit. So the KPI might be different from channel to channel, but like overall, we all align to the high level of marketing KPIs. And at the end of the day, as Nova say, we're here to move the needle. We're really using this data and we want to make a difference. By using it. I think that's kind of rare, honestly, for designers to have that connection to data, which is why I was so excited to talk to you too, because I'm a big nerd for data and things as well. Does this mean that your like personal performance at work is like these KPIs have an impact on it as well? Where like if a project isn't meeting its goals, then in your performance reviews, that would be brought up. Is there like personal accountability towards them as well? I would say in general, we kind of approach failures because if you don't try, you, you won't fail. So it's okay to run like a crazy test and it will completely fail. And it's even good because when you have drastic fail, you can really learn from it. So I won't say, okay, someone didn't make the KPI and it affects like his or her job, we really encourage like on the company level to try stuff, to like work fast, try stuff. It doesn't have to be perfect. Let's send it out to the world, learn from it, iterate it, make it perfect. But we're not afraid of failures. And it also connects like, you know, how we work in teams and channels. No one really is deciding for the whole team. Like we make decisions as a team. We like experience success as a team and failure mm -hmm. as a team. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. So does that mean that you as designers are having an input on what the goals are in the first place? They're not handed to you as a KPI. You can, um, someone's going to suggest it, I guess, and you can push back and say, I think we should go for this instead. You can be involved in that goal setting process. Yeah, totally. We have like a general uh, goals for each team, but I can tell you like on our team, we meet before every quarter starts and we say, okay, this is what we want to achieve this goal. And we're really doing team brainstorm with all different roles, developers, designers, content, like each one, we want to know what they think will be the best projects to work on as a team. And we do voting and we like have a full day around it. And then we decide, okay, this is what we're going to focus on in the next quarter. So no one is deciding. We, we decide in it together as a group. I'm sensing a theme here that a lot of things are like great group decisions in Monday.com. <laughs> um, so given this focus on data, right, and that you are paying attention to KPIs, that's how your work is measured. You don't do work if you can't measure it in that way. What role does data play in your day-to-day -day work then? What access do you have and what are you looking at? In the brand awareness team, for example, when we're thinking what's going to work, what's going to register with people, we make assumptions and sometimes our assumptions are wrong. We're here, like we're kind of biased. So we, before we make final decisions, we conduct user research. And user research at Monday is something that everyone in the company uses and is encouraged to be used all the time. It's accessible for everyone. And we constantly, constantly check our messaging, our pages, our designs, and before we go ahead and put a 100% in something that we believe in, we test the water. We could test a certain direction, or if we have a few possible directions, we conduct a comparison survey, we define age, country, you know, and other, other filters. 
And we ask, are you understanding the message? What company is advertising? Was anything unclear about the ad? What's the product in the ad? It's really important to us to stand behind our promise and that people will understand the value in the most accurate way and that they will understand that we're advertising a SaaS product and that it's supposed to answer a certain pain point. In every out-of-home campaign, we have to choose what our goal is. In a company like Monday, there are a lot of messages we can choose to focus on and we need to make sure that whatever we choose registers with people when they see the creative. Of course, we take the results with a grain of salt. We don't look at it as a crystal ball that predicts the future, if it's going to work or not. But most times we let it influence the decisions we make and it gives us a strong signal or it raises issues of things that we didn't notice even. I really like that because brand awareness is so freaking hard to measure. I'm responsible for the brand studio team at ConvertKit. And so like awareness and brand affinity is something that I'm responsible for. It's very hard to measure. And so what it sounds like you're doing is you're doing the measurement up front in a way. You're testing the ideas that you have and getting like sort of like a focus group of how this might play out in the market. Because obviously it's hard once an out-of-home campaign ships to do the measurement after of like people on the street. Oh, did you see that billboard up there? Tell me, tell me what you Um, saw. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, we actually do have tools. Tell me about them. Please give me your secrets. (laughs) Okay. As Daniel mentioned before, the main KPI is cost per new visit to our website. And in our online brand awareness activities, it's easy to track. And in the offline activities, it depends on the campaign. So for local offline activities, for example, a new offline campaign in New York, we have a method that checks incremental visits or signups. We look at the city we want to check the performance at in terms of the number of visits to our homepage and the number of signups in that city. Let's say Boston. And we take seven other cities that roughly behave like Boston. If let's say they have been behaving like Boston for the past year, it is likely that they will behave like Boston during the campaign period as well. If an average, we see that in those cities and in Boston, we usually have a thousand visits to our website a day. And suddenly in Boston, we see 25,000. We will attribute that to the campaign. And we also have a short-term and a long-term way of measuring brand awareness by a brand awareness survey. So for the long-term measurement, we conduct it every month in chosen cities in the US and some in Europe, and it helps us measure the marketing efforts across the company. We also do it before and after a campaign. We take a group of people, uh, they randomly sample people in a certain city and ask them how well they know the following brands and they show them monday.com and whoever answers monday.com they ask him about the sentiment about the brand and then we get an idea of the percentage of people who know the brand and after the campaign we do the same with another test group and we can see if the awareness to the brand has increased so these are these are the main ways there are also two other ways that we also use i'll just mention them Please. Uh, the first is like a question in the sign up flow. When a person signs up to money.com, there's a drop down menu that like, how did you hear? So we add, when we have a campaign on, we add billboards and media and the train. So that's an indicator. And we also have recordings of sales calls in the U S all the calls are recorded and we can search the word train or highway. Yeah. Cause it's transcripted. And then we see a lot of people say highway and this gives us, you know, reinforcement that a really big account uh, saw it out of home. And that's what convinced him to close the deal. Wow. That's um, a lot of data that you're gathering. And that's really exciting that you as a marketing designer have the access to that as well and that you're using it in your work. I find that super inspiring. Thanks for sharing all this all the secrets <laughs> might be some I can, I can steal for myself. Yeah, don't worry, Charlie. PR won't let me share secrets. <laughs> <laughs> we'll say that just in case they're listening. <laughs> and what about over on the web presence team, Danielle, what data are you looking at for the marketing side? Yeah. So we are looking for all the data around the website, obviously. And we just 
to like understand how much we close with the data, we start every week, uh, daily uh, with going over all of our data of wow. like running tests or general performance of the websites and everything. So we're, we're really like on it. And I also want to tell you about like super cool internal tool we're using to together all this data. More yeah. secrets, great. Yeah, it's, very, <laughs> it's not a secret, but it's a very <laughs> internal too. Uh, we have uh, something called Big Brain, which is basically like the place to gather all the data Monday related, like every visit, every click, every sign up, everything, like every failure and every success is in there inside this Big Brain. So this is what we look every day inside tool so we can see our test that's running inside and everything is measured uh, over there if i like zoom in a bit to the to the marketing area we can see inside all the a b tests that's running and monitored over there and we can really look and see how like the changes we made affects the sign ups and even like deeper in the funnel for example we can really see like the how changing an image or a button or a title in any of our pages affects the number of signups, which is crazy. It's really help us to make smarter decisions. And like, obviously every designer here is a good designer. You know how to create a great visuals and beautiful pages. But I think what the, really makes the difference and the real impact is how we connect to the data and we use it to design better, we are very aligned to the business goals, which in the marketing case is conversion. Uh, so we constantly around the data and it's something that very benefits us on our day to day. Did that come naturally to you, this embracing of data? Because it doesn't for a lot of designers. We fear data. We're like, oh, don't like look too closely because there's, there's things that can't be measured. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I can totally relate to it. I can say, say on myself, like when I see first arrived to Monday and I saw all like I can't show you the office right now, but everywhere we have like dashboards with tons of numbers. It's like surrounding us all the time. <laughs> so we can't escape the data. Slowly, like you just understand, okay, this is how we work here. It's very accessible and like we're not expected to know it like by ourselves. We have onboard these sessions and you have so many talented people to help you and understand it. So you just became like more comfortable with this over time. Once you understand, okay, it's amazing. I can really use these scary numbers to change what I'm doing and to make it better. Then you embrace it. But yeah, I understand you. It's like not the most natural thing for a designer uh, from the way I see it. But it's fun though, right? To be able to directly see how your work is impacting people and impacting the business and learn things from it. I personally find that data can help me make faster design decisions because mm -hmm. the more tests you run and you see how things are functioning, you can be like, well, I know this worked last time, so it might work here as well. So we'll try that first and it makes it easier. So speaking about like the investments that you're making in the monday.com brand and an awareness and all of that, I know you recently ran a Super Bowl campaign. I mean, that's the biggest type of campaign that I think you can ever run in the world. Tell us more about it, Noga. What did that involve? I'll say it involved a huge challenge that I didn't expect. First of all, it was all managed on a money.com board. On our team, we were two designers, two copywriters, one producer, one creative director, and the head of offline brand. Uh, we started with defining the goal, which was raising brand awareness and get money.com in that group of companies that are in the big game to gain that kind of trust from potential customers. We had a 30 seconds ad on TV, two teasers, special online edits, and the behind the scenes video. My role on the team was uh, designing the out of home campaigns, billboards, subway and bus ads across the national US that connects to the televised ad. So we had two challenges. One is that we had to create something that was visually and aesthetically coherent with the creative concept of the TV ad. And at the same time, completely independent because there will be people that will only see the ad of home and didn't watch the ad. So it needed to be like a standalone thing, but also connect to the ad in case the person saw both. Um, the second challenge, and here's what I didn't expect, 
is that on the day we filmed the ad, the tagline for the campaign wasn't finalized yet. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, which meant basically that we couldn't utilize the shoot to create the images for the out of home design, which would probably be, you know, the best way to connect the two. But yeah, we couldn't do that. And about two weeks before the out of home deadline, we finalized the tagline. We went with uh, Work Without Limits. And only then we sat together with our VP of Design and our CEO and we started brainstorming on a bunch of different creative directions to best express the Work Without Limits chosen tagline in the visual. So it could have been just a topography. It could have been the tagline as a title of the board. It could have been the tagline breaking through a computer screen or and this was where like we had our aha moment one of our initial mock-ups uh was a series of images with the work without limits tagline in different locations the desert antarctica the ocean and space and that's when we got it space the definition of you know limitless, limitless. Yeah. And it fit perfectly with our new branding of the Monday universe. And we had the last scene in the televised ad where people flew out of the ceiling and into the sky. So why not have them fly into the very space background that worked for our brainstorm session? And this is how I got to create a brand recall for both. And it worked and the ad included our design of space and brought the message across in the best way possible. Uh, so it worked as a standalone creative and also connected and like served as an extension to the TV ad. Did you say that it was two weeks then that you were doing the creative, like once the, between the tagline getting finalized and the assets being due, there was two weeks for you to work on that? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it was crazy. It was crazy. That must have been a busy two weeks. <laughs> It was. <laughs> it definitely was. Yeah. You can tell that the like strategy behind the campaign was strong though, because I'm very surprised that the tagline came last because watching the TBC, it's like, well, yeah, it seems like this imagery here has been created to demonstrate yeah. this tagline. Of course we knew like what we want to say. You know? Of course. Yeah. So we had a few options, like we had two or three options we were considering to say like the same message, but different wordings. But, you know, in order to create a design that is amazing for a campaign at this scale, you really need to have like the actual wording. Yeah. yeah. Especially for things like out of home where you're dealing with like different billboard sizes and things, you can't really like just make a mock up and add the text later because that can completely throw off exactly. the whole design. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Wow. Okay. So how long your part was two weeks, but how long was the whole process of making the campaign? We worked on it for five months. As we said, we're part of the strategy. So it's not like I came in those. Yeah, just in the last two weeks. Yeah. yeah, we were in touch with the creative agency that we work with and uh, made sure that uh, everything's on brand and like see the different aspects of the production, choices of location, styling, color grid, but it was five months. So that means that as the creative marketing designer, you got to have input on those decisions about the set and all that to do with the campaign too. Yeah. And the wardrobe and the location that we chose. Yeah. This just sounds super fun to be a part of. It was super <laughs> something fun. At that scale. It was super fun. <laughs> How often do you work on something that large? Because I'm guessing this is one of the biggest campaigns that, that Monday.com has done. Yeah, it was the first time we had a big game ad, but 360 campaigns uh, in the major cities, we aim for twice a year and in other markets, it's a, yeah. It's yeah, a and do you tend to have a different strategy behind each campaign? So like a different message that you're trying to communicate? Of course, yeah. And you mentioned working with a creative agency on the TVC. Is that something that you do a lot at Monday.com is work with like outside agencies for things like this? So again, the big game was a uh, first Mm -hmm. Uh, the agency that we worked with was like, they had a lot of experience with these kinds of campaigns. They're from the U S so it, it was also important for us to have like someone local who really knows, you know, so 
that's why we decided to go uh, with that. So this was the first campaign at this scale that you'd done, but what learnings did you take from past campaigns or localized ones that you brought into the big game ad? Yeah, so in the first few times in our iPhone campaigns, we placed our logo wherever it fitted with the design. We also placed in the bottom corner, the same way we do with online banners. But uh, in one of our past campaigns, the team went to San Francisco and saw that there are a few billboards where you can't see the logo because a tree grew there. And we didn't see that tree on Google Earth. So Damn nature. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so now we always place the logo at the top corner. Okay. And we work the design around that. So it could be an amazing campaign, but if no one sees who's behind it, it's a worthless. When you're in Israel designing for San Francisco, there could be many surprises. <laughs> many trees. <laughs> yeah. So in general, for an out-of-home campaign, the team always goes there to understand the general sentiment, cool. which places are best to advertise in, what's the areas people drive in, etc. How did this campaign go? We, you've shared before how you measure brand awareness in general, and I'm assuming you did all those same things for this campaign too. But what learnings did you take from this campaign that you think you'll bring forward into future ones? The day the big campaign went live, we had a situation room set up in the office. We had two shifts of employees to all watch it together. Not only as a way to celebrate this unique milestone, but also we had a mini task force assembled with content writers and designers and legal people and PR. So we could tackle like real-time marketing efforts and any comments that could come up on social media. We had also programmers to handle the massive uh, traffic to the website. And we understand now that we should have prepared for the event also in the context of social media. There were comments on Twitter, you know, like in the US, they watch the game and they're on Twitter all the time. So there were comments on Twitter that we had to design in real time. And like, next time we want to be ready for it because most of the big brands release their ad teasers before their events. So it's possible to be like, not to respond to be like starting the conversation. So by that, do you mean that you can release the teaser and then like you get a sense of how people are going to react so that way you can prepare things? Yeah, we had avocados from Mexico they, on the day of the game, they published like a GIF of avocados flying out of the building instead of people. Okay. Or, yeah. <laughs> or the minion stage, they put a minion face on the twins that we had in the ad. So we could have like do that, you know, and start a conversation with another brand even mm. before, you know. That's fun. That's cool that the ad had an impact that people were like, oh, let's jump on this. This is a fun like meme to play with. That must have been pretty rewarding to see, honestly, to see that when your your work like transcends and goes beyond the place that you put it in and people yeah, take it wow, on for themselves. Wow, wow, wow. It, was, uh, it was really special being here uh, in the office with everyone. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine that must have been a really fun environment to be in. How did the campaign transfer onto the marketing website as well? Because that I'm imagining is like the main property that people were coming to after seeing the ad. So were you involved in that side of it, Danielle? A few weeks before the big game, we started to think, okay, we need to also connect it to the website. It was all kind of connect, like come together at the same time. We changed the ribbon pop of the homepage was a bit before this. We now have a bit of the star theme in the first fold, which is also connected to the ad, so it works well. We also change the tagline for a few weeks to work without limits, to match it also. And I think we had a banner to send to the ad, like at the top of the page. So people who came to the Monday website was also, like if they saw the ad and they came, it was like a continuous uh, experience for them. Yeah, so it really is a, a project that all the different channels get involved in, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone in the company was really around the event. That's so cool. How often, you mentioned a homepage revamp just then, Danielle. How often does that happen? How often do you revamp the homepage? Um, in general, because we are enjoying a very high number of traffic in the homepage, we use this, uh, this area for doing a lot of tests because we can learn very fast and then it can trickle down to other areas. We're doing a lot of small tests all the time, but the full revamp, like the one we did a few months ago, it's something we do around a year or two. It's not very common. So there's like a big revamp every year or two, but then lots of little revamps. Yeah, all the time we try to perfect our page. 
Yeah. Let's go back then to this latest revamp. Um, and like, how do you decide when it happens? Is it like, it's been a year or two, it's time for a new homepage. Is there some sort of like data trigger that tells you it's time to start this project? So I think it's kind of both. Uh, we kind of felt as a team and I think as a company that the previous version is no longer really telling our story as a company, like in all level, in the term of value proposition, messaging and design. Because, you know, we became a public company, we went through rebranding, and we understood we need to rethink about this page. But obviously, as everything we do in Monday, we had also data to motivate us, because we saw that we have a high bounce rate in the homepage, and that people don't really scroll through the page. And we also saw a very short session time. We had, like, all the reasons to go for a revamp. Does that mean that the project goals then were to essentially improve on those metrics? Yeah, yeah. We had a few main goals. Like we first wanted to create a continuous and structured story because we really felt like the previous version is a bit of a mishmash of stuff that over the years, like we had small tests here and there and it wasn't like a coherent experience. And we also really want to give like a what's in it for the visitor to like really go with the value first approach and show it right away so people can understand immediately, okay, this is for me or not. We also had a new value proposition, you know, Monday is going through changes and we release new products. So we wanted to reflect it obviously in the homepage. And we kind of want to have like a better experience as well, like more interactive, more animations. Uh, we needed to progress from the old version we had. And I'm sure that like, yeah, more interactions and animations that increases the scrolling and the time. Exactly. Page as well. Exactly for yeah. those reasons. Like it all supported uh, the problem. Yeah. <laughs> How did you tackle this project? Like, where does it start? Does it start with a copywriter? Does it start with a group brainstorm? How do you approach starting a new homepage? This is a massive project, but like every project we tackle as a team, we start with kickoff. We have goal. Uh, we're doing kind of a brainstorm, like we say, okay, this is the goals, let's start to think about it together. And then after we came up with the content and the PMM, like on the general structure and frame for the page, uh, I started to iterate on the design and at the same time to send it out for feedbacks from different Ooh, stakeholders. That early. Yeah, yeah, that early, like very, very early, even a bit before the actual design when we were still like in wireframe, we say, okay, we want this section, this section, this section, we send it out because uh, it was super important to us as a team to create a homepage that everyone in the company will be proud of. It's not something we do every day, it's a super sensitive area, we want everyone to be on board with us. So we share it a lot in multiple uh, phases and we kind of share it like with all the marketing department on several occasions we got feedbacks like we really involved everyone uh, inside of it and also around the design guild i did a lot of brainstorm sessions with multiple designers and we did even hackathons around it which was a really event like a big event that everyone in a way one way or another was a bit involved in you mentioned A-B testing earlier as well. Did you run tests before the page launch to like decide what should be a part of it? Definitely. Or Yeah. Okay. Tell me more about that. Yes. So we work with a growth methodology, which is basically mean that we iterate fast to learn fast. We start with an hypothesis, which is always our Northern style and it's aligned with the KPIs. For example, like in the homepage project, we, we had an hypothesis that says, we believe that showing use cases in the first fold of the homepage will bring more signups. So this was the hypothesis. And then we came up with execution. So for every hypothesis, there is like a million possible executions. In our example, the execution was showing checkboxes with different use cases. We design it, we develop it, and then we go live with the execution as an A-B test and get a result. A test could, could never fail, as we said at the beginning, like also good to learn from the failures. But in this project, I can tell you, we ran over 30 A-B tests only on the first fall. Yeah, so we had so many executions for the same 
hypothesis and we also like learn from each one of them and go back to the like uh, table i don't know how to say it but like rethink about it as a team we ran user interviews around it we did usability hub and we keep iterate and iterate until we had a version that met the kpi and managed to improve so Definitely, A-B tests play a huge part uh, in this revamp. Were you testing these before the full revamp launched or was yeah. this? Yeah. yeah, wow. yeah. We kind of split it into first fall because we know it's the area that gets the most traffic and it's easiest to win. Uh, and people don't have to scroll yeah. to it. <laughs> exactly. So we constantly, constantly release tests. We had like stuff that we thought, okay, it's going to definitely win, but it wasn't. Like it was a super interesting uh, process. Oh, that's always good and like nice and humbling, right? To, to yeah. test a design and then it doesn't meet what you thought. And you're like, well, okay, I was wrong. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. So you kept the same hypothesis the whole time of the, the use cases and what you were testing was essentially different designs yeah. for showing this. What made you decide to keep trying different designs versus deciding the hypothesis is wrong we were wrong about this idea so let's move on and find something yeah. else no the hypothesis can also change a bit we also like sharpen it a bit or adjust it or we can come with new hypothesis but we just saw that it's always work just to show use cases we try to find the best solution in how to show it Nice. So if I'm understanding correctly, what might have happened was that showing use cases improved the KPIs, but then you were testing, okay, well, how do we get this to be even better? And also, how do I show the use case in the best way? How it's like affect the signups? How will people understand, okay, I can manage all of this. I will sign up. Uh, so you can show it in many different ways. And we tried many different ways. But at the end, we always like the checkbox solution is always the best solution. Why do you think the checkbox solution won? Uh, we were always asking this question here because <laughs> we really see it works not only on the homepage, but on acquisition and everywhere. It's like such a good, um, I think it's like the best way to crack it from what we had so far. It's super like understandable. It's simple. It's kind of playful also, like there is an interactive uh, a side to it, which is also good. So uh, I think this is why it works so well. And I see, um, cause you sent me this amazing slide deck about the changes that 80% of the users who click on the tags are then going to click on the get started button. That yeah. is insane. High. That is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <can't beat> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is, I wish that I could do that for our homepage. So this is good inspiration for me. <laughs> and how does a homepage revamp apply to the rest of the site as well? Because obviously we want to give users a consistent experience across the site. We don't want them to hit the homepage and then go somewhere else and be like, this looks totally different. How do you handle that when you are one person, now two work designers working on web presence, but still that's a lot of pages to uh, work on. I can't tell you like everything is perfect and we get to everything right away, but we have to prioritize. We say, okay, the first, the homepage is the most important. And then we split our uh, quarters projects accordingly and like one by one, we revamp it and we also have like um, broad cross uh, changes that was like once you implement it here, it trickles to all other pages. Does that mean that you feel like you're you're like always working on a revamp of some page because it's so, <laughs> so large? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it never ends. Like you can always do it better. And like this is what we do in the growth like methodology. We keep get like searching for new opportunities to improve. There's always a page being revamped. There's always a test running that you're learning from. <laughs> There's always That's something right. happening here. Yes. It also happens like on all of our landing pages. Yes. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the changes we've done, we're doing the homepage because we get like results very fast. We say, okay, we saw a big win here. Let's share it. And then it like trickles down to acquisition pages and all other pages. Because we are instantly like, how do you say, embrace it <laughs> to other areas take the learnings from one and, and apply it to yeah. other things too, to move them up. Yeah. I love that. How long did you work on the homepage revamp? How long do you get to work on this? Cause I feel like our deadlines are often very short in-house marketing design timelines. Yeah. How, what did you work to? Uh, it was, I think one of the longest projects that we made, but we were really fast here, but it was around six months. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So six months from like deciding to redesign the homepage to it launching. Yes. 
the final launching because we had like a few launching along the way. Yes, yeah. <laughs> no, of course. How does that compare to other web presence design projects that you work on? Say a landing page or like a page further in the site. How long would you spend on that? It's, it was different on every level, like the amount of people involved, the amount of, of like traffic we get to measure it. It's like um, you can't really compare. It's kind of unique project, I feel. Uh, we, we work in the same like way for all the projects, but in like smaller scale. So like pages further in the site would be a shorter deadline because they... Yeah, yeah. Shorter yeah. deadline, maybe less like people involved because you can't involve the entire marketing department on every, <laughs> every page. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, they've got other things to do. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. We've talked a bit in here about um, challenges that you've faced along the way, whether that's, you know, like um, the tagline coming two weeks before the end of the project or a B test not going how we thought. But what are some of the main challenges that each of you are facing right now, uh, either as individual designers at monday.com or perhaps within your channels, within your teams? I would say one of the most interesting challenges right now is the transformation of Monday from a one product company into a multiple products company. On the web presence team, uh, we're trying to understand what is the best way to actually communicate it on our website and what is the best go-to-market strategy. So we, we're really busy around this area uh, right now and we're working on a lot of tests around the header menu, uh, the homepage in general, the entire website, the sign-up process. So this is like top challenge at the moment. That'll be exciting to watch it play out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, you know, go. I think I'm dealing with the same challenge from a different angle because as the marketing designer in the app marketplace, which is a cross product, meaning it's relevant for all in each of the new products we launch, I need to make sure it's communicated in each of the funnels for each of the products and understand what's the right value prop in each product for each persona. So, and when is the right time to show it? Where is the right place to show it? Etc. So like, it's different because I need to not to now uh, talk with different teams, you know, in order to, to um, sync everything yeah. together. You're like this connection point for all these different parts of the right. company. And what about growth in your career or like in your roles? This is something that I know my listeners are always really interested to hear about. What's next for you uh, as creative marketing designers? Yeah. So I mentioned in the beginning that I'm now working on in a new channel uh, that's uh, it's called user marketing and it's a new area in the company and I'm conducting a lot of research. It's going to be a lot of UX UI design, which is very challenging and exciting. It's not uh, my main um, expertise and uh, it's something that I've never done before. And it's a platform where users are going to upload templates and others can duplicate it and use the templates. So there's going to be a lot of research after it's up as well and to see what people understand and how they're using it and if they're like liking it. That's cool. I love that you get to shift around the areas of design that you're working in and learn these new skills, build these new skills within the company. Yeah, it's amazing. It's a really great opportunity for me. What about you, Danielle? Uh, for me, I think it's definitely to deepen my product and UX skills because my role is kind of a mix between marketing and product. So I constantly try to perfect my abilities. But also we talk a lot about data and then we mentioned it's not always the most like natural things uh, for a designer. So I definitely want to work, like to feel even more comfortable uh, with working with data and to, to use it more and more. I think that um, it's funny to hear you say that because you're one of the most like data savvy designers <laughs> that I've spoken to as part of the series. Like, so I love that you're still pushing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it's fantastic. Okay, let's end by you sharing in your time at monday.com, what is a project or an impact that you're most proud of having worked on? And maybe is it one of the ones that we talked about already? Yeah, well, of course, the homepage for me was a huge milestone, but I'm also really proud on the part I'm taking in the more strategic areas, uh, which is a huge challenge, it's super interesting, and it's something we're constantly dealing here in Monday. So definitely this is uh this is something i'm really proud of love that yeah i think of course 
the big game campaign was huge. Um, but uh, I'm also part of a lot of different smaller projects that made an impact. Could be a YouTube ad, could be like uh, developing our photography language, for example. Yeah, as we said, like ownership and impact is something that we're all really proud of and it resonates across all we do. And we're excited and there is so much more to be done. Always. <laughs> Always. Well, I feel like I could talk to you both for at least an hour more. And maybe we'll have to do a take two of this because you just mentioned then Noga developing a photography style. I'm like, oh, I want to hear more about that as well. <laughs> but thank you so much for everything that you've shared. This has been fantastic. And I'm sure the listeners really enjoyed it. Thanks for coming on. Thank, thank you, Charlie. Charlie. It was so fun. It was really fun. <laughs> Woohoo! I love hearing about marketing designers getting involved with data. And if that's not an area that you've embraced yet in your design process, then I hope this interview inspired you to like befriend the data folks in your company and ask for more insights into the way that your designs are performing because you can learn a lot from it. I also really loved hearing about the culture of feedback and ownership at monday.com. The way Daniela Noga described it, it was very relatable to me working at a small company where that level of ownership is just like needed to get things done with a small team and small resources. But it's something that often gets lost as companies grow and more like processes and layers are put in place. So for the team of Monday to have that when there's more than a thousand people, at the company around the world is pretty special and obviously allows for some really great work to happen. I'd love to hear your takeaways from this episode though. Feel free to comment them on the YouTube video or tag me on Twitter or in an Instagram story. I'm at Charlie Prangley on both those platforms. What stood out to you? What did you learn from this episode? Check out the show notes at InsideMarketingDesign.com for links to Noga and Danielle, and you'll find all the previous episodes there too. Huge thanks once again to Webflow for sponsoring this season of the show. You can create an account and like play around for free with that CMS that I was mentioning before at InsideMarketingDesign.com slash Webflow. Thanks for listening and I'll see you in the next episode.